afternoon, after uh, the assistance of these young guys like Andy, um, technology is second nature, right? You write, do you ever have to write anything anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out. Um, I'm Tom Watson, president of the Whitefish Area Property Owners Association. Um, we've, we're basically going to focus on two stories today. Um, I'll introduce Jeff here in just a moment, but here a couple weeks ago we learned that a uh, gentleman that has had some intimate knowledge with the uh, oil industry as a property owner in Michigan, um, and over lunch I just learned that uh, he's been here 25 years, his wife has been here since birth, uh, visiting a tip-top resort. Um, and he tells me that uh, there's a lot of good golf, right? Um, and so he's going to be a part of that. Most of you have seen Richard Smith before with Friends of Headwaters, our neighbor over in Park Rapids. And um, um, his email is, describes him, Grizzly, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you want to see the hump of my back when I get mad? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to set this up a little bit by just explaining um, how we're basically seeing uh, this matter of oil pipelines in this particular area. There are people who have um, probably related very well to the fact that oil pipelines belong somewhere other than in the waters in north central Minnesota, just because that's where they belong somewhere else. Um, some of us have looked at it for reasons of, of uh, science. What's the impact been as a result of both construction and as the industry and Certain vendors now refer to those as anomalies. Uh, I grew up in International Falls. We used to call those spills. Um, and um, some of us took a look at it uh, from the standpoint of things like economics. In other words, if things were to happen that weren't desirable or planned, uh, how would that impact uh, areas that we know? I've been up here for, uh, Jane can confirm this, uh, she brought me up here 50 years ago, and I basically haven't left, uh, other than to go to the cities to work every now and then. Um, and her family's been here for well over 100 years, owning property on the North Shore of Big Trout Lake. So, a lot of interest. By way of um, acknowledgement, I grew up on Lake Cabotogama, which is Voyager's Park, so if you read the Sunday paper, you saw a nice piece on that. Um, and my, my grandfather had one of the first resorts on Lake Cabotogama, built in the uh, 1920s. So northern Minnesota and water and me go a long way. We've been together for a long, long time. Um, I grew up as a kid. Um, my favorite line I tell somebody when they'd say, you know, growing up in northern Minnesota, it's awfully cold up there, isn't it? And so forth. And I used to say, my father's line, I would say, uh, actually, it's not too bad if you long as you remember to take your long underwear off on July 3rd and put it back on on the 5th. I want to just review with you a little bit um, the case that we make at Wapoa uh, with respect to this matter of water. It's gotten to be a conversation piece for sure. Um, and I think many of us have become aware of matters related to the quality of water in the state of Minnesota, partially because it's all of a sudden starting to be front page news. In other words, it isn't what it was. And the question is not only where is it and what is its condition, but now we're inclined to figure out how to remediate that problem. In other words, we didn't take care of it at the time. And there are still parts of Minnesota where the water quality is still, so, still very, very good. These are quotes and pieces that I've pulled out of various um, pieces of literature. Because lakes are central to Minnesota's economy and way of life, it is imperative we maintain or improve water quality. The Whitefish chain of lakes, water quality on this chain of lakes, has deteriorated several feet since 1990. Varies from lake to lake. But the deterioration in terms of water clarity, um, some of the phosphorus and other chemicals and things we find in the water has deteriorated in that period of time. Big Trout Lake, for example, is a spring-fed lake. There's one small creek coming through there that's dammed by the beaver. Um, water is deteriorating on Big Trout Lake. So if you can help figure that out, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a hydrologist, 
but that's enough evidence to tell me we got to do something about it. Minnesota water has come a long way when raw sewage used to flow into the rivers. As a kid, I remember that. Families' sewer pipes went right straight into a, to a swale. The bottom line is we need to do more, and it's us. We're the problem. We're also the solution. I won't repeat all of this except to simply say roughly half of our lakes and streams in Minnesota have been tested for pollution, and of those, 40% do not meet Minnesota water quality standards. Now, the bulk of those are in southern third of Minnesota. Um, but we're starting to see some of that impact move into this area. Very last piece, overuse, pollution, and waste are threatening drinking water. We had a guy by the name of Pete Jacobson who was out of Park Rapids. He's a, a cold water fish biologist with the DNR. They were doing a study on lake trout habitat on big trout two years ago. And among other things, he said, our lakes are becoming <coughs> overused. The major impact that's threatening our lakes is overuse. I had a conversation with a gentleman who happens to be in here yesterday about the size of boats, the speed of boats, the draft on boats, <coughs> the wake from those boats, the, er the erosion that's a result of that. The question that raises for some of us is water temperature, um, some of those impacts that are occurring <coughs> as a result of that. Nitrogen and phosphorus, we know all about that. Pumping oil through Minnesota lakes. <coughs> this is my favorite quote. I wrote to this guy. <coughs> Some of you know Paul Eberth. He is the Enbridge manager out of Dul their Duluth operation. Um, the very first time I ever spoke negatively about routing pipelines, this is not need for pipelines, this is routing pipelines through this country. He sent me a long letter and indicated I obviously wasn't very smart and hadn't figured this thing out. Well, this is the quote I found of his in the Duluth paper. Many of the alternate routes that veer west and south of the state's northern lakes country would cost more. <laughs> In other words, any doubt about the economy and profitability of shareholders of Enbridge driving the hearse? Because that's exactly what we got going on. This is not pretty. This is the Conservation Minnesota piece. Lakes and rivers are our most vital natural resource. Simple everyday things we can do to make a difference. Engage members across the state in water policy. One of the things we're trying to do at WAPOA is communicate with people about what is in front of us, letting people make their own decision. We've always assumed quality water will always be there. Why not? It's always been there. We have never been threatened by quality water. We love to jump in the lake and take a swim. We have our grandkids do that. We've enjoyed that major asset around us, but the fact of the matter is it's deteriorating. Our leadership in our state government, my opinion, um, lacks the testable fortitude to do what's right. All right? We have it in county government. We just had 10 inches of water in this chain of lakes over the last two weeks. Cass County put a no wake policy in the entire county. We can't get anything out of Crow Wing County other than Last Friday morning, if WAPOA would put up some signs on our access, you can put out a message that you're asking people to be nice and not have wakes. <laughs> so is there a significant impact? Some of you have seen this, and I know that you have, and I apologize for going through all of that. Um, here's the Pat Welly piece. Pat said that back 13, 14 years ago. Water quality and property values are related. The unfortunate part of that is if you want to improve property values on lakes, in many cases you could be doing so at the detriment of the water quality itself. In other words, fertilizing your lawns, making it look like suburban twin cities uh, won't be good for the waters generally. Here's a map of Minnesota, um, basically breaking the state down into these quadrants. And red in this case means these are polluted waters. And in most cases they are not retrievable. And as you move north, you notice more blue, and blue is a good thing. So here's your pipeline going right through here, the black line. Now, unless you're colorblind, it obviously makes some sense that you ought to recognize you're putting the, proposing a pipeline, two of them, at least to start with, more maybe in the future, through the bluest parts of Minnesota. 
This is a piece that I dug out of research, and I've got more coming uh, with respect to property values, but uh, this is a research piece that's done at the University of Minnesota about every 10 years. Um, and I put this up partially because Enbridge just commissioned some people at the business school at UMD to uh, put out a, quote, fiscal impact statement um, that during two years of construction, they will generate $2 billion worth of impact on the economy from the 15 counties starting at the North Dakota border to Superior, Wisconsin. And they will create, I don't remember the number of jobs, uh, a half of whom will be residents. Jeff's got some things to say about his experience with the residents of Oklahoma <laughs> working in Michigan and not people from his county. Um, so I thought, you know, it'd be kind of interesting. Well, he, here's what this points out. If you take Crowing, Aiken, Cass, and Hubbard, that's the four counties in that proposed pipeline route that, we, that I call North Central Minnesota. Travel and tourism, these are people who are not residents, are spending $700 million. This is in 2008 during a recession. And Enbridge is going to do this $2 billion, $2 billion for two years. Guess what happens in the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year? This continues and only grows. And it produces 17,000 jobs. They're going to produce 2,000 jobs, only 20 of which will be long term. Okay? So we're willing to risk this part of the economy for a one time shot of $2 billion worth of revenue during the two years of construction. My math doesn't. Tell, tell me that worked real well. Um, what this also points out is, except for Hennepin and Ramsey County, this is the biggest impact of travel and tourism anywhere in Minnesota. Anywhere in Minnesota, except Minneapolis and St. Paul. This is strictly, um, in recent years, now this is just visitors. So this is not property owners owning second homes or any of those kinds of things. This is just people that are coming up here, staying at a lodge, staying in the campground, whatever, in 2014, those same counties generated, and that's part of that earlier number, $377 million. And you can see what the growth has been over that roughly 10-year period. Here's the Pine River watershed that we're in. So today you're sitting actually right here. Um, here's Big Trout, here's the Whitefish Chain, here's the Pine River coming in. Um, you notice that this map shows you that this watershed gets awfully close to Park Rapids up here, that's Hackensack, up on the north end, and going all the way to the east side of, of Outing, abutting actually Big Sandy and, and that direction, and then of course further south, picking up Pelican and Breezy and so forth. It's basically a half a million acres of land and water. Here's the whitefish chain itself, so you can orient where we are right now, we're sitting right here, right there. Um, and we're about 14,000 acres of water in Minnesota, which makes it one of the largest in the state. This is strictly the impact on Crow Wing County only. And I've tried to be nice over the years working with our county, uh, but they don't get it. This is the largest industry in, the, in Crow Wing County. The only problem with it is travel and tourism is not an industry. It is a combination of a lot of pieces. Grocery stores, hardware stores, lodging, gas stations, uh, bait stores, rental operations, etc. Those are all the individual industries. So nowhere do we capture this data as a single industry, except here. Um, this is the largest piece. So what's the economic impact of all of this? Then we go to second homeowners. That's not even a part of that other data. The University of Minnesota just released this in October last a year ago, showing that direct spending was about $300 a month. That's just consumables. That's grocery stores, that's going to the liquor store, that's going to, the gro going to uh, bars and restaurants, whatever, in the area. If you factor in property tax, and I'm sure that varies among each of us, but I know in my case it's 6,000 bucks, all of a sudden we're looking at about $10,000 per household. That's over and above everything I showed you earlier. So do we have a single, is this a large impact? Of course it is. So what are we going to do about all that? This is kind of the end for me. And the smarter guys are going to tell you what to do. But I wanted to set them up. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I don't know whether I'm like a uh, senator from Michigan last night at the DFL convention, or if I feel like uh, Al Franken, who did his piece. I, you know, I don't know where I fit in this thing, but I'm going to do my best to set you guys up. 
So how do we sustain that impact in the local economy? Well, how do we combat the threats from AIS, water quality deterioration that we know is happening, pipelines, overuse, etc.? Jerry, overuse. What can we do? What must we do? Can we create a shared vision? I've talked about shared vision on this lake chain for the eight years I've been on the WAPOA board. It hasn't got a nickel's worth of traction. In my mind, there would have been the cities of Cross Lake, 50 lakes, Manhattan Beach, the three townships around this area. Probably would have extended beyond that. I see my friend Dr. Weaver back there. I know he buys into this. And that is, we would sit down and put together a vision of what this area looks like and should be, and what's the future plan going to look like for Northern Crow Wing County. And guess what? The representative of District 2 in Crow Wing County finds none of this important. And he will probably tell you there's 40% water in his district. I start raising a question, something called the bio biological carrying capacity of a lake. The DNR doesn't want to talk about that. Let me tell you what it is. When I was in city government in the Twin Cities for 18 years, we had an overrun of urban white-tailed deer. And we got to work with the DNR on something called the biological carrying capacity of land. So if you had an acre of land in a city and it was undeveloped, it could handle you know, 15, 18 deer per square mile. If it was developed, you want, they wanted that number down to six or eight. The definition of, they wanted it to be healthy biologically for the deer, the trees, the plants, anything else happening in the area, even your hosta, okay? So I raised the question with the DNR up here. At what point are we beginning to have a negative impact on our lakes in terms of fish, habitat, etc.? At what point do we start to look at the biological capacity to run a pipeline through there with the risk of spills? My point of this is we got to be smart enough to be able to figure that out. When we take all the studies that have been done, all the threats and impacts that are there, and the condition we find at the moment, and build a plan around that sort of definition. Okay? It works. It works for wildlife. It works for other sort of things. Why can't we deal it with, with it in terms of aquatic situations? Here's the map of Minnesota. I said the third down here is not very good. This is under stress. Here's good areas in northern Minnesota. Here's our pipeline. So we already got some stress in this particular area, and we still want to go there. Here's the proposed pipeline through our area. Here's the whitefish chain. All the blue lines will show you streams and creeks that are, that are crossed by the proposed route through this particular area and impacting the whitefish chain and then obviously down through here to the Mississippi. Here it is on the, no on the northeast. So here's outing um, in this particular Mitchell Lake and the 50 Lakes area. They're all being impacted. And, you know, the greatest mystery in all of this is Enbridge told us two years ago that if you ever had a spill, they would capture that spill within two or three or four miles. <laughs> Jeff, I think you have something to say about that. Okay? So, very last, and then I want to turn these guys on. We've got lots of, lots of opportunities to do what's right, but we need to get together. We need our local governments to be involved in this particular decision. We need all of us as property owners, visitors, whomever, to care. Um, just as a point, the local economy in terms of the business community that supports us, WAPOA, is probably less than half the businesses in this particular immediate area. There's some of the threats that are in front of us. Notice the proposed route. We're not talking about the need for pipelines. We're talking about the route of those pipelines. And very last, here's the commitment we've made from the very get-go. WAPOA has been standing at this commitment for 48 years and isn't about to change, which is how are we going to sustain and focus on water quality and improve on that water quality? And as I say here, it needs a total effort. All I know is in the last three years as we've been talking about this, all of a sudden it's starting to register with some folks that apparently we must be starting to build that case that says, you know, I wonder what the hell these guys keep talking about. I wonder if it's starting to be an impact or concern. Well, it is. It is. We're starting to see some people show up who two and three years ago told us we were crazy talking about these things. How could you pose pipelines? I got 14 cars in my driveway or whatever. 
Why would you oppose that? In terms of routing, we're still raising that particular question. And how about the commitment to this biological capacity? And very last, if we're going to continue to enjoy these waters and these kinds of things, we have to understand how this fresh water is being impacting us. The threats we have are impacting that, which is really vital to our lifestyle up here. We can go to the lake. We have to keep informing people. We have to keep talking about it. People have to just simply get smarter. Okay, that's my piece about this whole thing. Um, what I want to do now is I want to <coughs> introduce you to a gentleman who uh, three weeks ago I didn't even know. I thought the only one talking about these kinds of things was Richard Smith. Jeff Insko, as I mentioned a minute ago, has spent the last 25 years uh, with his family vacationing at Tip Top Resort. Some of you know where that is, on the point between Clamshell and Bertha. Uh, he told me there's some connection through a third party family relationship that knew the Schultz family and had been visit visiting up here. And so some of his family, his wife's family, have been here a long time, um, 50 or 60 years. Jeff is a uh, professor of American literature. Um, at Oakland University. I heard Dave's, Dave uh, Fisher tried to enroll there, wouldn't, they wouldn't let him in. <laughs> Dave worked for Chrysler and Ford Motor Company and lived not far from Oakland University. So when I was telling Dave about Jeff's background, he said, you know, I probably know a lot of his colleagues that taught at Oakland University. Um, Jeff and his wife bought land um, in Michigan, had direct experience with Enbridge on a easement that was on their pro property at the time. And all I know is Jeff said the good neighbor discussion they had didn't last very long. And he can tell you about that experience. Given he's been in this area, he understands the topography, he understands the impact of water in this area. And it strikes me that uh, Jeff is, can relate both to what he had, what experience he's had in Michigan, and what the impact would be here if we were to have spills and those kinds of things. So, Dr. Jeff Inscott. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> I, I, can, I can use this one. I think it's oh, you can. Yeah. Sure. Well, let's go get you a oil and dip. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, and it's been a pleasure uh, meeting Tom and his wife Jane and, and uh, uh, getting to know more about WAPOA. It seems like a really fantastic uh, organization. Uh, Cross Lake matters to me. Um, my, wi my dog is at Northland Pet Lodge right now, <laughs> hopefully having a blast. You won't get him back. I know. <laughs> he, I better get him back. Uh, um, and as, as Tom pointed out, I've been coming here the area for 25 years. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a funny coincidence. Um, two years ago, um, I'd been writing this blog um, about my experience with Enbridge, um, which had kind of grown and spiraled in ways that I never in a million years expected. And uh, the friends apparently had gotten wind of it somehow. And, and I got a, a note one day from one of them and said, who said, uh, you know, would you ever want to come to Minnesota and give a talk to our organization? And, and I said, well, oddly enough, I'm going to be there vacationing in two weeks. And, and so it happened two years ago up in Park Rapids, and, and here I am again. Um, so uh, the Enbridge experience, I should say, it's, um, the, uh, one of the series, I guess, we did on the blog um, was I asked, I'd been opining in various ways, professors are windbags, so I'd been opining on the blog away for a couple of years, and, 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 but I'd been hearing, and in some ways, I guess, speaking for lots of landowners along the pipeline route, which I'll talk more about, and for a long time. But um, I thought that people ought to get to tell their own stories. And so we did a series where I just asked landowners to write up as long or short um, an excerpt as they wanted um, to tell their story of their experience with Enbridge. And, and one of them titled um, her uh, piece, The Enbridge Experience. And I always like that um, because it's a, um, it's a unique experience that I wish upon no one. But that, that's where the name comes from. So, I think so most of you probably already know that on July 25th, 
that date is important, as I'll mention in a minute. Um, 2010, so six years ago yesterday, a pipeline ruptured in uh, Michigan near Marshall, um, spilling over a million gallons of tar sands oil into Talmadge Creek, which is a tributary of the Kalamazoo River. Um, and the oil eventually made its way. It was, um, the water was very high at the time and winds were heavy and, and the, wa uh, the oil made its way into the river um, where it, um, and you know, th I don't know what you know about tar sands oil, but it's a unique substance. It's what's gonna go through line three. It's not like conventional crude oil, which floats. Tar sands oil is a, is a thick sludgy material that they have to mix with a diluent to, be, to get it to go through a uh, pipeline. Um, so um, what happened was the diluent all evaporated, including benzene. We don't know exactly what the diluent's made of. It's proprietary information that the companies won't tell us. But that all evaporated, and what was left, the thick, heavy stuff, all sunk to the bottom. Um, and this was a problem that no one had ever faced before. Nobody knew how to clean it up. The conventional methods for cleaning up this kind of spill, or for cleaning up oil spills, did not apply. So it took five years to clean up that uh, river. Um, and in fact, they had to dredge the entire river. And Talmadge Creek, in fact, um, that, it's, that it's spilled into initially, they actually tore up all of Talmadge Creek and then used Google Maps to recreate Talmadge Creek. So now what we have is a simulated Talmadge Creek created by Enbridge, as opposed to the real Talmadge Creek created by Mother Nature. Um, uh, but so it's the, it's the second largest, Richard hastens to point out, um, inland oil spill in American history, but it is unquestionably the most expensive oil s uh, inland oil spill in American history. It, it costs over a billion dollars for Enbridge to clean it up. And uh, the truth is, um, the river, even though it looks clean and shiny and new and all of that, um, we don't really know what's left there in the river. They can't get it all out. There's no way. They'd have to dredge the entire riverbed, and they've been dredging for years. So what's left is left. Um, and we don't know if there will be any long-term effects of that. We really don't know. Maybe there won't be, but we don't know. Um, we also don't know what sort of long-term health effects um, will be had upon the people who lived in the area and who, and who were displaced. Um, I think one of the great travesties of the spill is that there really have been no long-term public health studies about um, what this has done to people, um, and we don't know. Um, and nobody seems to want to fund those kinds of studies anyway. Uh, but anyway, here's a picture of uh, the Kalamazoo River. Um, after the afternoon. Um, but so what happened was, um, initially, Enbridge wanted, after, a, after shutting the pipeline down, oh, I should mention this part. Um, I assume everybody knows the story, but maybe you don't. Um, the Enbridge was aware of anomalies in that pipeline, which was 40 years old. Um, they had data that showed there were problems and cracks and other defects with that pipeline. They knew about them for five years and they didn't do anything. They found all sorts of ways to avoid taking action on the data that was telling them there were problems with that pipeline. And so it ruptured and there was a six foot seam in the pipeline that all the oil spilled out of. And when that happened, when, the spoil, when, the, when, the, when that initially happened, they got word in their remote control room that there was a problem with that line. And what they thought in the control room or what they decided in the control room was it was what they call column separation, which is a fancy term for like a bubble in the pipeline. Um, and they thought, okay, well, we, you know, we, we can take care of that. Even, even though they had rules in place um, for uh, what they were supposed to do in an instance like this, which is to shut the pipeline down. They decided instead it was column separation. And so what they did, instead of shutting it down, they turned up the pressure. Um, and, and that oil spilled out of that pipeline for 17 hours before anybody found it out, um, which is why it was so bad. And again, these are all things, if you read the terrifying, horrifying National Transportation Safety Board um, report on the spill, it is, um, it is a scathing report about um, uh, Enbridge's actions uh, prior to and, and during, uh, during that spill. Um, but so what happened was initially, um, after they got things, they got the pipeline shut down, some time had passed, that same year, Enbridge wanted to keep using that pipeline. And they were like, they were asking EPA to, you know, can we turn the thing back on? Um, and uh, EPA allowed them eventually to turn it back on, but with um, lower than normal operating pressures. Um, and it became clear uh, to Enbridge that 
um, EPA was never going to lift that restriction on their operating pressures. So now all of a sudden, instead of reusing that pipeline that had just ruptured, and we're like, hey, we should replace that. That'll be really great for safety. Um, and so in 2011, they came knocking on my door uh, and informed us that they were going to um, uh, replace the pipeline. And this is the really the kind of story that I want to tell is about what happened then. Um, okay. um, but two quick points before I go there about um, uh, as kind of kind of preface, um, because uh, I mentioned the date of this bill, July 25th, 2016. There's a couple of interesting anniversaries um, uh, today, I guess, or this week. Um, one of them is it was when we came on vacation in 2011. Uh, 2012, I guess, was when I launched the blog. It started here in Minnesota. I was typing away furiously when I should have been enjoying vacation time on the lakes, not catching walleye. Um, um, but uh, I wanted to show you uh, quickly um, the route that we take when we get here, and there's a reason for my showing you this. So we live down here in the southeast part of Michigan, and what we do is we come up I-75, and we go across the Mackinac Bridge, and we just take a left, and that takes us here. That's just from Google Maps. Um, uh, and along the way, um, this is what we see. Um, I don't know, you're probably familiar with these orange markers. Like all the way, like all the way up 75, we see those orange markers. Um, we go across the Mackinac Bridge into the UP, we see those orange markers. And um, those are marking um, an end bridge pipeline. Um, and that pipeline is, is um, line five, um, which is here. So this is line five. And the thing I wanted to say to you about line five, if, if you're paying attention to any news in Michigan, line five is very controversial right now. It was built in 1953, so it's some 60 years old. And the thing about line five is that it goes underneath the Straits of Mackinac. Like it's 60 feet underwater. There, and there are actually two pipelines. One carries gas and one uh, carries oil. And, that's, and so there's a tremendous amount of pressure now, public pressure that's mounting and growing um, for Enbridge to decommission those pipelines, to put them out of commission. I, I, think, I think anyone, it seems to me, who, is, who does not work for Enbridge thinks that those pipelines are a bad idea. And, 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 and I, I was just thinking about this. Like, and every time I, you know, when I tell people that there are pipelines in the Straits of Mackinac, they're like, what? Because it seems crazy, right? Because, I mean, in the, in the 1950s, let's be honest, we did all kinds of things that now, in retrospect, seem crazy, right? There was asbestos in our homes, you know? We, I, I can, I'm old enough to remember smoking on airplanes. You know? We didn't wear seat belts, like <laughs> stuff that was just crazy, and we can't bl bl be blamed for it exactly. This is what we did 60 years ago. We didn't know, but now we know better, right? And it seems to me that we know better, that that should seem crazy to anybody. And, and when I think about a pipeline going through the headwaters of the Mississippi River, Right? And, and, and across all these tributaries to the chain of Whitefish Lakes, that too seems to me like smoking on an airplane. You know? um, okay, so anyway, um, the Line 5, though, is just a part of a pretty extensive network of pipelines that Enbridge operates in this area. It's called the Lakehead System. So uh, here's Line 5. Um, and this one is Line 6B that goes through my backyard. Um, so uh, line 6B ruptured sort of here in Kalamazoo, um, and uh, I live kind of over here. Um, oh, I have a thing. I for, I've got this fancy thing. So <laughs> I'm not accustomed to using these. OK, um, okay. so uh, on our drive here, uh, so here's what happened. Enbridge knocked on the door. They said, oh. Um, we're going to replace that pipeline in your backyard. Isn't that great? The new one will be start shiny and safe. But by the way, all those trees in the back of your yard, like the reason you bought the property, I'll show a picture of these in a minute, we're going to have to cut those down. And that, then that gigantic perennial garden that you spent six years uh, creating um, that's outside of the easement, well outside of our easement, we're going to need to take that away too. Um, we didn't know what to do. We freaked out. We were um, worried and concerned. Um, but, you know, at first we thought, well, you know, what, what can we do? They do have an easement on our property. We were aware of that easement on our property. Um, I, yeah, they have a right to use it. Um, why they don't want to put, why they don't want to uh, do construction from the other side of the trees where our neighbor just has open land was sort of strange, and I didn't understand that. But nevertheless, we weren't going to fight them. We weren't going to complain. We were just going to try and work with them, um, as they like to say, as good neighbors. But it, came, it became pretty clear to us pretty quickly um, that their good neighbor rhetoric 
um, didn't always align with their actual behavior. Um, and so we spent six, nine months negotiating with them about various things, just about the way they were going to conduct themselves on our property, about how they were going to compensate us for the damage that they were going to do. And I'll just give you one little taste of the, of the way those negotiations went. So, so um, uh, you know, a 50-foot blue spruce tree in your backyard, um, uh, especially if it is at the very back of your property and is a green wall that, that um, gives you privacy um, and that is, like, I mean, trees matter to us. There. Um, and we had 105 of them. Um, and this was, in many ways, the reason we bought the property in the first place. Like, so those trees to us <coughs> are actually irreplaceable. I'm never going to, I can't plant a tree that's going to be 50 feet tall in my lifetime again. Um, um, but to Enbridge, you know, at best, a tree like that is worth timber value, if that, right? So somewhere between nothing and invaluable is the range within which we had to negotiate with them. And of course, they've got the state of, the power of the state of Michigan behind them, the power of condemnation or eminent domain. And so, I mean, we, we have no, we have to, we don't, we don't, we don't have any leverage um, in that regard. And, um, and so, um, you know, this is it dragged on. They didn't even want to meet us halfway. The land agent would, sh well, we went through like four different land agents because for various reasons, um, they didn't follow through on promises. They'll show up on your property unannounced. Like it was a nightmare, it was a disaster, even at the negotiating stage. So finally, right before, we were just tired. Nine months later, we were completely worn out and we just wanted to be done with it. So we signed, we weren't very happy with the deal, but we um, got some, we convinced them to at least put some things in writing with regard to how they would conduct themselves during construction. I'll talk more about that in a bit. And we find, right before our vacation, we didn't want to go on vacation to Minnesota with all of this hanging overhead, so we, we signed our papers um, and we left for vacation. And it just so happened that in that year, I think it was 2012, um, there was a lot of construction around, um, so remember, we come up through the UP. Um, uh, you know what's here, right? Um, there was construction in downtown Superior, um, and we had to go through town instead of around town, and we're driving along, and we look to our right, and that's what we see. <laughs> that's our dog. Um, is Enbridge headquarters. And, and we're at the stoplight, and my wife says, you should totally go up there. And I said, and do what? And she said, go talk to him. I said, okay. So she sat in the car with the dog, taking pictures. Uh, and I went upstairs, and I, and I said, I just, can I speak to somebody in, you know, who's in charge of land services? Um, and they were, thought it was very strange and weird, and uh, so-and-so wasn't there, and so, but they found someone to talk to me. And so, so I went in and, and sat down in front of someone and, and talked to her for a very long time, sort of told her our story and told her all the, the, the terrible things, uh, the, the nightmare that was this process of negotiation, and that, that I was hearing similar stories from our neighbors and so forth. Um, and of course, you know, she promised that, that she was going to look into it and get back to us. And of course, you know, we went home, uh, and, and no one got back to us. Um, I mean, how neighborly is that? Right? Um, and so this was kind of the thing that really got us frustrated and um, made us want to not only protect ourselves but help our neighbors. And so, um, so the blogs, you know, was sort of conceived here in um, Minnesota and then continued. And that's what it looked like when we first uh, started it. Um, I got to talk on the phone with an Enbridge VP early on for a long time. That didn't go anywhere. Um, but I mentioned this, so, so uh, I was talking about anniversaries. So, so one anniversary is this kind of, it's kind of the anniversary of the creation of the blog, but also today is the anniversary of the, uh, is an interesting anniversary. It's the anniversary of the day that Enbridge sometimes liked to pretend that the Kalamazoo River spill happened. Um, and this was um, two years ago um, in the Detroit Free Press. This is a, just an interest in the blog. Um, there was a letter in the Detroit Free Press on July 26th, 2014, in which the uh, executive, Brad Shamla, talked about the importance of this day in the corporate memory of Enbridge um, because it was the day that Kalamazoo happened, except that it wasn't the day Kalamazoo happened. Kalamazoo happened on July 25th. But 
if so, so there's this kind of interesting thing going on, right? That, that I, Enbridge wanted us to think that July 26th was the day, because that's the day they found out. <laughs> what they don't want to remember is the day before when it gushed oil for 17 hours, <laughs> right? And I mean, I mentioned this because, I mean, I don't know how that could have happened. Like, how Enbridge could have thought that they could, in a major newspaper in Michigan, um, pretend that the day after the spill was the day of the anniversary. And, and I, I just, I have to say, it just, um, I'm, I can tell you from experience, I'll have lots of stories like this today. This is just sort of emblematic um, of a kind of, I don't know what to call it, intractable disingenuousness um, that seems to follow Enbridge wherever they go. I hate to say that, but it's, I think it's, uh, it's kind of true. Like there's some sense in which they just can't help themselves. Um, okay. Uh, there's another anniversary too, um, and that anniversary is that um, last week, um, Enbridge finally um, was, uh, well, reached a settlement with the Department of Justice for fines related to the Kalamazoo spill. It took six years for this to happen. I don't really understand why these things are a matter of negotiation, um, but they were. Um, and Enbridge had been talked with, talks with the DOJ for a really long time. And they were finally hit uh, with, as the Detroit Free Press said, a $177 million bill, which is kind of an interesting thing to say, but also sort of a problem. And just really quickly, I want to point out that they weren't really hit with this $177 million bill. They were, they were given a $61 million fine for the spill in Kalamazoo which is, uh, to my mind, a paltry fine. I think the last quarter of 2015, Enbridge made $900 million or something. Don't quote me on that. Those numbers are just like approximate. Um, $61 million is not much for the uh, second worst inland oil spill in North American history. Um, the other $110 million, though, um, are for various kinds of things that DOJ says that Enbridge has to do, um, various kinds of maintenance and repairs on some of their pipelines, including line five that I showed you, but also um, on line three, which is of particular interest to you. Um, that's the one that Enbridge wants to put in the same corridor as the Sandpiper pipeline. And the thing about this is, I think when I read that, I was, I was shocked and horrified. And I thought, this is, this is terrible news for Minnesota. Because what the settlement says is that it's got a whole bunch of, it says that Enbridge probably should replace that pipeline. Um, actually, no, it says they have to replace that pipeline. And then it says um, they have to decommission the old line three unless they make various and sundry repairs, in which case they can use that line three. So they have to replace line three, and they can, uh, and to give you, so there'll be a shiny new one, and they are, it's still possible for them to continue to use the old one. The reason this is such a problem, like on the surface, that might seem like a good thing. New pipeline's better than old pipeline. Repaired pipeline is better than decrepit pipeline. That's good. Except that now what Enbridge is going to do, I promise you this is what's going to happen. For the next year, as the controversy over Sandpiper and Line 3 continue, every time Enbridge is asked, I mean, just you, you, uh, start you know, a tally, um, they're going to say, look, you know, the feds say we have to do this. We have to do this. They're going to say, you know, like, sorry, locals, doesn't matter. Feds say we have to do this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a sledgehammer that they swing to ram their desires through. And, and the funny thing about this $177 million bill um, kind of masquerading as punishment for the Kalamazoo River spill is that they're already, as you guys know very well, they were already planning to replace line, to replace, um, line three. So this isn't punishment. This is the money that they were already going to spend. This is money that they ought to be spending on routine maintenance anyway. So um, many of us are very, very unhappy with the so-called settlement that was announced last week. Um, and it just so happens to coincide with, with this talk uh, and today. OK. OK, but so um, back to, I guess, my story. Like, Because five years ago, I didn't know much about any of this stuff, almost nothing. Um, I just knew there was a pipeline in our backyard and that somebody was knocking on my door saying they wanted to replace it and that meant destroying our property. So this is the back of our property. These are our trees, you can see. This is the garden, there's grapevines there. Um, that's what uh, we bought. Um, a lot of those trees are outside the easement. This is something that um, you don't know um, when you buy a property with an easement. Um, you probably don't even know this when you agree to an easement with a pipeline company, is that 
Just because they have an easement that, say, is 60 feet wide, that doesn't mean if they're going to do construction, they don't get access to more land. So they took an additional 90 feet, I think it was, maybe it was 70, of what they called temporary workspace. So that perennial garden there, a lot of those trees are all in the temporary workspace. So that's not even their easement. That's just a temporary easement that they got. Um, and that's my dog, <laughs> who's at North End. Um, OK, so and then this is, um, I'm not sure how to make this. Should I just tap it? Oh, no. That's a video. Will that play? I don't know how to make that play. Does anybody know? I thought. Wow. Sorry. It's OK. Um, this was going to be a video of them cutting down the trees, which in a way is sort of amazing. If this weren't, if this weren't your, your property that you love, this would be kind of cool because it's amazing. This great big machine. Um, and it, I mean, those trees took 50 years to grow. They were down in 45 minutes. Just oh, there. That's good enough, Tom. That thing's just a monster. Just cutting down trees, stacking them up. Thank you. Like they're matchsticks. I'll stop because I hate that video. Um, <laughs> one, one, yeah. Just one second. Just take a break. Uh, only this regard. Let him continue to go. We're not going to take a break, but there is lemonade oh. and cookies and whatever in the back. So. If you're ready for a treat, yeah. help yourself. I, I, I teach college students. They're always rustling around doing something, not paying attention <laughs> to me. So I, I won't be offended. Um, so this is what it looked like afterwards. Um, and so off in the distance now, that's the, that's the other side of the neighbor's property. And where the green pipes were, that's where our trees were. Um, and so this was used as a staging area um, on our property for, for months and months and months. And, and um, uh, the process, the construction process, you know, when a land agent comes to your house and says, you know, we're going to do this pipeline, you know, they, they tell you, it's, it's going to be great. You know, we're going to be there. They come in little waves. This will we'll be done in three months. We'll be in and out. And this process from, uh, from cutting down those trees to restoring our properties was four years long. Um, and um, I'm, I was thinking a lot about Tom's point about protecting the water. And I think that's the crucial point um, for this area uh, when, it when it comes to tourism and so forth. But I also think it's worth considering this, that if this project happens, you know, Enbridge is going to be doing that construction in these areas for a very long time. And it's going to be dirty and loud and messy. And it will probably last a really l much longer than anybody at Enbridge says. And I'm just thinking, if I'm a tourist and I come to this area, and what I see is that big mess, that's not going to make a very favorable impression upon me of the area. And I'm not sure if I'm choosing a place to vacation, that's going to be a place I choose again the next year. Um, at any rate, so it's, it's sort of a footnote, I guess. Um, so a four-year uh, long process, um, during which I can't tell you how many times, and we're lucky. I'm an academic, so I have a very flexible schedule. My wife works from home. So we were home almost all the time during construction. And we were there kind of watching vigilantly as to what happens outside all the time. And we had a list of items that we had agreed to with Enbridge um, that, that was called a line list. And this had to do with the ways they were to conduct themselves, things they could and could not do during construction, which, by the way, they would not put into a legal document for us. Um, they refused at every turn. Why, I, I have no idea. Because when you ask them about um, the line list and how can we hold you to it, they say, well, you know, it's, it's our word. And I said, well, if it's your word, why don't you make it a legal document? Oh, why would we do that? And, um, at any rate, um, it must have been six, seven, eight times um, where they flagrantly violated some item in the line list. And simple things, like, you know, as you can see, you saw from our gardens, we're people for whom flora matter a great deal. That garden was really important to us. And, and my wife understood that, um, this was going to wreak havoc on the soil that she had spent years, you know, uh, 
carefully depleting its seed bank by hand, by pulling out weeds carefully. Um, and she came, she looked out the window one day, and this is the neighbor's property of, I have this thing, and this is the neighbor's property way over here. And she came home one day, and she saw this bulldozer pushing dirt from the neighbor's property. They don't tend their property at all. Um, just pushing the dirt over onto our property. You know, just like weed-filled dirt all over our property. Like instantly the prospect of recreating that garden is um, uh, destroyed. Um, they're they were supposed to sequester topsoil from the subsoil. We came home then, so they had all the, um, where these wood chips are, that's the remains of some of the trees. They put the topsoil in fr uh, right behind that. And then we came home one day, they were digging a trench to put the pipeline in, um, you know, four feet down, and we just, s we watched and we filmed as that train just takes that subsoil and just dumps it on top of the topsoil. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, part of the point here is that Enbridge land agents will tell landowners all sorts of rosy stories about how smoothly this is all going to go. Um, and it won't. Um, and it's not as if we're talking about the occasional mistake. Things that I've just tried, those two examples from just my property are only two from my property. And there were several more. And these things were endemic all up and down that pipeline. Um, they're not just occasional mistakes. They're the way that pipeline construction happens. And so when land agents tell you everything's gonna be fine, we're gonna make you whole again. We just wanna be good neighbors. I can tell you from experience, and, and, and lots and lots and lots of my fellow landowners on Line 60B um, will agree that you can literally cannot believe a single word that they say. You can't. And, and so, you know, on the one hand, you've got executives um, pretending that the, that the date of the spill was a different date than it happened. Down at the bottom, you've got land agents telling landowners all sorts of rosy stories that can't be believed. Um, this, is, um, this is the way that they conduct business. Now, I do have to, I have to say one thing. I, I'm always very sh uh, sheepish about talking about our personal situation because honestly, um, compared to so many other landowners up and down line 6B that they replaced, we had it really, really easy. For example, <laughs> this is not a friend of mine named Beth Newman, and um, that's pipeline construction happening eight feet out her back door. Um, and she had to live with that um, for months and months and months and months. Um, and she wasn't the only one. There were a number of, I mean, so talk about routing. Like this, this is a kind of, this is a routing issue. Um, in the same way that Enbridge wants to build a pipeline through the sensitive, these sensitive aquatic areas, um, they don't mind sending up, uh, building a pipeline, they'll build a pipeline anywhere. I mean, I, I imagine there's somebody who sits up in an office in Alberta or Superior somewhere with a map and just draws a line. And then says like, go make it happen, right? It doesn't really matter to them very much where, where that line is exactly. Um, even if it's six feet away from people's houses or even if it's um, in the, uh, across the headwaters of the Mississippi River. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, while Enbridge was, during the course of the replacement of Line 6B, um, destroying people's properties, um, abusing their easement rights, mistreating landowners in a thousand different ways. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've barely told you any stories about the abuse of landowners that happened on that project. Um, they were also running roughshod over and through local municipalities um, who tried to get Enbridge to behave in various kinds of ways. And a really good example of this is um, the, the township adjacent to mine, which is called Brandon Township. And Brandon Township is really interesting. Um, they have also some headwaters that they wanted protected. And they were very concerned about this. And they tried early on to get Enbridge to um, agree to various kinds of conditions. And Enbridge's answer, and again, this goes back to line three and the way that Enbridge is gonna use that DOJ consent decree. Enbridge's answer to everything that Brandon Township said was, pipelines are regulated at the federal level. You say boo, Enbridge says, pipelines are regulated at the federal level. You say, what about our woodland or woodlands ordinance? Enbridge says, pipelines are regulated at the federal level. So they're gonna say, DOJ says we gotta replace line three. 
You know? We'll route it somewhere else. DOJ says we've got to replace line three. That's what's going to happen. Um, so um, the Woodlands Ordinance that I mentioned, this was one of the things. Um, so, so Enbridge wouldn't even listen to Brandon Township for months and months and months and months. And finally, Brandon Township um, <coughs> wanted Enbridge, at the very least, to agree to comply by the township's Woodlands Ordinance, which said if you cut down X number of trees in our township, you are obligated to replace them at a rate of Y. Right? And Enbridge said to them, you know, um, we don't have to comply with local ordinances. Um, and Brandon Township, fortunately, unlike most townships, Brandon Township dug in their heels. Most townships don't do this, and understandably so, right? Municipalities do not have the resources to take on a fight with a mega conglomerate like Enbridge. They don't. But Brandon Township was stubborn. They had a visionary, wonderful, strong leader, and they weren't going to give in. Um, and so they fought and fought and fought. And only, it wasn't until, and Enbridge just um, wouldn't even talk to them for months. Um, and finally, um, when Brandon Township, it looked like it was going to sign on a lawsuit, which, was, which is potentially could have been a federal lawsuit. Finally, Enbridge decided they were going to play ball, and they went and had this big meeting with the Brandon Township Board. Um, and they agreed, not that they were required to comply with the ordinance, but they would do some of the things that the ordinance says. Um, and very quickly, uh, Enbridge failed to deliver on those. And, and this is an actual quote from the actual Brandon Township supervisor, who said, we want to see the pipeline in place. We're concerned it be done in the proper manner. And she said very um, plainly, Enbridge does not appear to be sincere in what they have communicated to the township. Again, when did Marshall spill happen? You know, <laughs> is the pipeline replacement project going to happen on my property the way it says it was? Are you going to do the things you told the township supervisor you agreed to do? Um, these are, there are countless, countless examples like this. Um, just one other one. Um, this is just more of the same. I'll, 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 I won't belabor this. Um, but again, it's more of the same. Um, um, another example. This is, I think, one of the, one of the worst ones. Um, this wasn't about the replacement. This was about the cleanup. So Enbridge was dredging the Kalamazoo River. The only way to get that oil out of the bottom was to dredge it. So they dredge all this material. They take it to a site where they would somehow clean it, separate the sand from the nasty oil, and then I guess return the sand um, to the riverbed, uh, something like that. I don't know the ins and outs of that. Um, and, at a, and at a certain point, Enbridge, in 2013, Enbridge was trying to secure a new dredge site. And the local community did not like the, the site of the dredge pad. For one thing, it was next door to a brewery. Bell's Brewery, by the way, great beer, two hearted ale. Um, <laughs> Uh, lots of people in the community were not happy at all with the, with the chosen site for the dredge pad. And so um, Andrew was trying to get permits from this township so they could go forward with it. And the township was refusing them those permits. Because of this little skirmish, Enbridge missed a uh, deadline set by the EPA for s continuing their cleanup work. They missed a deadline. And so um, the uh, vice president of Enbridge, um, wrote a letter to the EPA uh, describing why they had missed the deadline. And what he said was this, that um, it's been discontinued uh, because Enbridge selected a site, um, but unfortunately some local residents and business owners uh, have vigorously opposed granting the permit. As a result, the township has not yet issued the required permit to allow us use of the specific site. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, they selected a site and met all technical and practical requirements and promptly applied for the appropriate permit from the township of Comstock. Um, so he wrote this letter to the EPA as a way of explaining why they haven't met their deadline. This is simply, basically, demonstrably, and factually untrue. This is an Enbridge VP writing a letter to the EPA that is just simply false. And the, Clark, the Comstock Township supervisor even said so. Um, um, without Enbridge applying for and obtaining the necessary township permits required under the township's ordinances and its zoning. Right? Um, so again, the way that Enbridge conducts its business is it, it simply tries to do what it wants until someone stands up and uh, demands they do otherwise, and then they still try to do what they want. And I mean, I think that the, the, the what's been happening with Sandpiper uh, and Line 3 
illustrates this point, um, that there are uh, numerous instances of a similar kind of behavior. Um, so one other example, um, and I'll stop this. This is just from up in Canada. Um, Enbridge wanted to build what was essentially the Canadian Keystone XL, uh, a northern gateway pipeline that was going to run across all across Canada. Um, and um, uh, they were required to conduct meaningful consultations, I've got to get used to this, with affected First Nations. But the National Energy Board, uh, the regulatory body in Canada, um, ruled that they had not done this. They had not fulfilled their basic obligations to consult and engage in meaningful consultations uh, with First Nations. And so Northern Gateway very well um, might be dead. Um, but so, but the, so the reason I'm telling these stories is, is that um, there's a pattern of behavior here that I think is, is um, fairly clear. Um, okay. Um, and again, there are countless other stories of this sort um, that I could be telling, like stories that simply fly in the face of the public en uh, image that Enbridge presents and promotes, and whether it's in conversations with landowners or conversations to local officials or in the press um, and, els and elsewhere. Um, so why does all this matter? Um, what's the lesson for you all, I guess? Um, I guess uh, maybe three quick things. Um, um, first is that I think the, the historical record shows that Enbridge isn't going to change voluntarily. Um, and part of the problem is that federal regulators aren't a whole lot of help. Um, the, the federal regulatory agency, um, the Pipeline Hazardous Materials uh, Safety Administration, um, was in the NTSB report on the Marshall spill, they came in for as much criticism as Enbridge did for their weak regulations. Um, and so as a result, like it's, it's, it's this terrible uh, catch-22 where um, federal regulators don't seem to want to do much that has any teeth. So it's left up to states and local municipalities to try and do something. But when they do, Enbridge says we're regulated at the federal level. It's a difficult situation. Um, but nevertheless, states and municipalities have to step up and do something. And citizens have to. I think wh what the experience I've seen shows is that when local citizens get their local officials involved, then things start to move and things can potentially happen. Um, but it has to happen at the local level. Um, um, the other thing is, and this is a problem that I admit um, I'm not sure how to overcome other than by agreeing to give talks like this whenever I can, um, is that people understandably want to believe Enbridge. They want to believe Enbridge when Enbridge says, this is going to be great for your economy and it's going to create dozens of jobs, even though when I spent four years walking out my back door to talk to the construction workers and ask them where they were from, they said to me, Oklahoma and Texas and New Mexico, and once in a blue moon, somebody said Michigan. Um, or even when Enbridge finally went through the process after they uh, installed their pipeline, um, and they were going to, uh, it was time to restore land, they sent a company to restore land that was from Wisconsin, even though there are dozens of outfits in Michigan, even in my county that could have done that work. It was Wisconsin, and, and in fact, that Wisconsin company did such a bad job that, they, that, uh, that Enbridge finally, after residents all up and down that line complained, they finally hired a Michigan company to come back and redo all of that restoration all along the line. Um, uh, but, but so th those, as Tom's already pointed out, like, those stories about jobs um, are crazy. Um, they, the number of jobs that are going, there may be an X number of jobs that are created, that doesn't mean those are local jobs. And as Tom also pointed out, those sure as heck aren't permanent jobs. Those are those are temporary jobs, and they're not gonna they're not gonna be around for very long. Um, I think maybe I should shut up. I've gone on long enough. <laughs> I'm just gonna stop there. Okay. Thank you for listening. I'm going to suggest a five-minute break because I have to switch this line. And uh, number two, I know there's a lot of lemonade and cookies back there, much of which is colder than the room. 
Um, but don't leave, because they've got a, we're going to bring this story back to local area with my friend over here in the blue.